questions uh, during the webinar, please write them in the chat box and send them directly to the Conservancy. My name is David Cowell. I'm an ambassador and citizen scientist with the Kuchiching Conservancy. We like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the territory of the Anasabi, Anishinaabeg, Wendat, and Metis people. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties, and we are all treaty people. We'd also like to give a shout out to our wonderful sponsors who have made this event, as well as the entire Passport to Nature program possible. Please consider supporting these local businesses. All of them are doing great work to protect the nature you enjoy. The Kuchiching Conservancy is a nonprofit, non governmental land trust. With the help of thousands of supporters like you, we've been able to protect over 13,000 acres of natural areas in the Kuchiching Severn region. Hundreds of volunteers help us care for the nature reserves through citizen science projects, trail maintenance, community outreach, invasive species control, and much, much more. This map shows all of the nature reserves that our community of supporters help protect in the region. Many of the Conservancy-owned nature reserves are open to the public, with a total of 13 kilometers of hiking trails. Our first speaker this evening is Linda Forster from the Aurelia Horticultural Society. This organization has been an active and vibrant part of Aurelia's culture since 1888. The Society's objectives are to hold informative and educational meetings, encourage improvement of private and public grounds, exchange seeds, flowers, bulbs, and plants, and promote the protection of the environment. Following Linda's presentation, we'll hear from Miriam Goldberger from Wildflower Farm. Since 1988, Wildflower Farm have been living the wildflower life. They harvest, dry, clean, package, and sell the wildflower and native grass seed that they grow on the farm. They also consult on projects throughout North America. May which, please welcome Linda and Miriam. Thank you, David. <laughs> so hello, everyone. My name is Linda Forster. I am the Vice President of the Aurelia Horticultural Society. And today I'm going to be talking to you about seven native pollinator plants that will really fit into um, any kind of garden. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means in, in just a moment. Next slide, please. The Aurelia Horticultural Society was founded in 1888. So we've been um, partners with um, the city of Aurelia uh, for quite some time. And our main objective really is to sort of help beautify the city. We do um, educational sessions and seminars uh, throughout the year. We do things like plant sales um, and we help to kind of maintain um, certain areas within the city, such as the library and the Arboretum. We are a nonprofit organization and we primarily consist of volunteers. So our objective really is to kind of learn about gardening, have fun while we're doing it, and really to help sort of maintain and support some of these green spaces uh, throughout the city. We have a really active uh, group. It's hard right now with the current situation, but want to um, feel free later you can check us out on Facebook we have a fairly active community group on Facebook as well we share photos and um, tips and tricks and different things um, on our Facebook group as well so feel free to take a take a look at us on Facebook next slide for me please so when we were looking at different plants to talk about in terms of pollinators, I really wanted to emphasize plants that could be used in any size garden. So whether you have a container, like a patio, and all you have is containers in different size, um, different size boxes to plant in, or whether you have a large border, we wanted plants that would really sort of fit in either side. So you don't have to have a huge garden or a huge yard in order to do your part to help support pollinators. So we're going to talk about some of the different plants that are both native and also supportive of pollinators that will fit any type of situation. And the first one 
I want to talk about is called blue-eyed grass. Now, I will not attempt to do that because my Latin is very bad, um, but blue-eyed grass is a great sort of a spring starter. A lot of people look towards pansies and, and other plants like that, but blue-eyed grass is a different alternative possibly use. Um, and it is a very open flower, so it kind of looks up and it catches your eye. It's great for birds and it's an excellent early source of pollen. So when our native pollinators are first starting to wake up and get going, it's hard for them to find sources of food. And so these early plants that allow uh, pollen and food sources for our pollinators are really key and important. So you could try something like blue-eyed grass. I would probably put it closer to the front of a container or front of a pot if I was doing up a, a big, big or if it was your border, I would put it in the front of the border. The great thing about blue-eyed grass is after it's finished flowering, it continues to look like a grass and it has a very interesting seed head. So it's not just for one season, it will carry through forward into other seasons. And it stays pretty low, about one to two feet tall. And it really is in the spring, it catches your eye. It's very cute and don't underestimate it, but we do suggest maybe trying blue-eyed grass. And I'll get you to go to the next one. The next one is probably one of my favorites. Again, it's another grass. This one is very well behaved. It stays in a lovely tight uh, bunch. It's called prairie drop seed grass. Um, and again, I would probably closer to the front of a border or front of a container where it can kind of flow over or flop over the front of that container. Or if I was using it in a border, I'd put it at the front of the border or had a kind of rock garden, it would look very nice kind of flowing over um, your rocks. It likes full sun, it's drought tolerant, so if you were to put it in a container, it would do very well. You wouldn't have to water that container all of the time. Um, it does stay, like I said, in a very nice tight clump. And the other thing is it stays green and then in the fall it gets these beautiful pink and brown um, kind of spiky flowers on them. It's an excellent food source for birds. And when the frost hits it, it looks just lovely. So again, it's something I would leave in a container. I wouldn't pull it out. I would keep it there all season long, straight through into winter. So you don't have to swap these things out. You can leave them in place and get, uh, get more, more bang for your buck. Uh, next slide for me, please. The Rattle Snake Master is another fantastic um, native plant, and I don't know, I don't know if Miriam actually turned me on to this one um, the first time that I saw it. And it is, a, there's a large family of um, Eurynjums, but this one in particular gets lovely tall, probably be two to four feet. I would make this kind of like my thriller in a container, or I would put it closer to the back of my back of my border. It gets these beautiful seed heads on them. And the thing about these particular seed heads, given the shape, you want to try to support as many different pollinators as you can. So there's short tongue and long tongue bees, and this helps to kind of provide for those different types of bees. And we also really underestimate bees. No one really likes beetles or predatory insects, but they're extremely important. And when we talk about pests in our garden or things eating our vegetables and our plants, it's these predatory insects and bees that are going to help keep keep those things in check. So provide, by providing a food source for them, um, you're helping to sort of maintain some of the natural habitat in your garden. Again, I wouldn't pull this plant out if I put it in a container. Leave it through the fall, through the winter. It will stand up nice and straight. It will get some nice snow on the top of those seed heads and it will look just lovely um, all season long. Next slide, please. Purple cone flower is the darling of most people's uh, gardens. Everybody knows purple cone flower. And there's lots of different colored cone flowers on the market now, but the purple cone flower is really the tried and true uh, cone flower of the market. Some of these newer varieties just are not standing up uh, so well to the test of time, but purple cone flower is very drought tolerant. Um, it branches out nicely so it fills in a good space. Again, it's got a domed kind of head on it so it will support a multitude of different butterflies and native bees. And if you leave 
those uh, flower heads in place, then they become seeds for finches. Finches will love your purple cone flower. And in addition to that, um, a lot of people like to clean out their gardens, but if you leave your plants in place like the cone flower, it's a fairly hollow tube. And these tubes are needed for different native bees to, to sleep in and stay in over winter. So by leaving these plants in place, not only do you continue on with that um, sort of structure in your garden, but you're providing a habitat for these, for these bees to, to sleep in over the winter time. So you can leave them, it's very drought tolerant again. So instead of having to water your containers all the time, you can look at putting some of these native plants in and they'll stand up better in a container, especially if you wanna go away for the week, you won't come back to completely wilted plants. Um, and everybody loves coneflower. So even if it does spread a bit, you can split it up, share it with your friends, um, and it's a great addition to any border. So next slide, please. Um, this uh, darling plant is the blazing star. The, again, there's a couple different kinds of blazing stars, um, and they do look fairly similar with these tall spikes, but sometimes the flower placement's a little bit different depending on what variety of star that you select but it is um, a fantastic plant in the garden. It is very drought tolerant as well. Mine started blooming the last couple weeks and it will carry forward. And again, um, even after the flowers fade, it does provide structural interest. If you were putting it in a container, I would again probably put it towards the back. I would leave it over the winter time, let the snow fall on it. Um, it's an excellent food source for butterflies. It's also the larval host for some species of moths. And I know people really discount moths, but they are an important part of our ecosystem. And I know that from watching um, some of the other uh, webinars I've seen from the Kuchichin Conservancy talking about moths. So I have a new appreciation for them. Um, and they are an important part of our, of our ecosystems. Um, they're very valuable to bumblebees and native bees as well for pollen sources. So it's not only is it a beautiful structural plant, but it, it supports a lot, of different, um, a lot of different aspects of your ecosystem. Next, Next one is uh, Coreopsis. And again, there's a couple different types of Coreopsis. But I truly love the way that Coreopsis kind of dances in the wind. It is a beautiful plant to have um, in your garden and it's very bright and cheery. It is an excellent source of pollen and nectar for, again, different insect flies. Um, it likes full sun, it can handle part shade. I would probably put this maybe closer to the middle part of a container if I was doing one. It only gets about one two feet high. Um, it's again very drought tolerant so it can handle being placed in any type of container situation that you don't want to water all the time and I would put it kind of in the middle middle side of my border not at the back and not quite at the front um, but Coreopsis comes in many different shades and colors and different leaf uh, shapes as well but it's an excellent plant for your garden and um, next slide please the next one is um, wild columbine, and there's lots of kinds of columbines. Most people are familiar with like the blue and the pink one, but the red one, um, again, not great with the Latin, but our native wild columbine is a, a fantastic flower. It is a variety of situations as well. Uh, it will grow in part shade um, straight through to sun. It's uh, great at attracting hummingbirds and bees and butterflies, as well as hawk moths. Um, and it's a seed source for buntings and finches. So after that flower is gone, don't be so quick to deadhead some of your plants or cut them back. Let those seed heads stay in place and let the birds and different animals feed from them, but also it's how they can spread or propagate throughout your garden. This is um, a late spring bloomer, May to June. And probably again put it closer to the front of my container or front of my border. It does seed itself around, but it's nothing that's invasive or, or prolific. You do have to be careful though. So when we talk about varieties of flowers, um, some of the, the non-native varieties of columbine are not as hardy, but this one, our native one, is extremely hardy. So it can 
it can handle some drought tolerance as long as it's not in blazing hot sun. So we've seen this kind of go from shade through to sun, but you just have to be mindful about where you're planting it. So kind of just an overview of the plants we talked about. So Coreopsis, the blue-eyed grass, and there's a photo there of one of our members. Um, she's got a photo of the seed head. So seed head is, is visually interesting if you, if you leave it. Wild columbine, prairie drop seed, Blazing Star or Liatris, um, Blue-Eyed Grass, you can see an actual picture of the, of the flower there, the Rattlesnake Master, and the Purple Coneflower or Echinacea. And again, these can be adapted to be either planted in a container type garden. So if you only have a patio, you can put a couple of these in a container. They'll do very well. Or if you have a larger garden, they'll adapt very well to a border. Next slide, please. So I just wanna thank, thank you from the Aurelia Horticultural Society for having us here today um, and giving us the opportunity to talk about something we love, which is plants and pollinators. Thank you. Thanks so much. David, did you wanna introduce Miriam again? Sure. Okay, our next speaker is Miriam Gold. Uh, Goldberger from Wildflower Farm. Okay, since 1988, Wildflower Farm, okay, has been living the wildflower life. Okay, they harvest, dry, clean, package, and sell the wildflower and uh, native grass seed that they grow on the farm. Okay, uh, they also consult on a wide variety of projects throughout North America. So, Miriam, take us away. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to uh, Wildflower Farm. Uh, I'm very happy to be with you this evening. I have about 25 minutes to cover a huge uh, range of topics related to native plants and what's in bloom at this very moment. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to begin by taking you on a tiny walk to one of the uh, gardens in bloom here at Wildflower Farm. This is a garden that is a combination of native plants and non-native plants, but I'm gonna focus on the native plants that are in bloom currently. Here we go. Okay, right here you have great blue lobelia and this is a beautiful plant. It's not quite in bloom, but you can really appreciate the lovely blue color. Here is Monarda, or Monarda fistulosa. Here is Nodding Wild Onion. Mm -hmm. That's a great plant for midsummer. Most of the alliums that everybody's familiar with bloom in the spring or very early summer. Here is Butterfly Weed, or Asclepius tuberosa. And here we have one of my super favorites, wild quinine. And then right there, you're seeing red milkweed. Red milkweed. Okay, so that gives you a little bit of a peek about what's going on here at Wildflower Farm. I'm heading back to a table, and I had a wonderful time this morning harvesting a really broad range of native plants that and, and grasses that are currently in bloom. Let's, without further ado, get into that. All right, so here we go. So now Linda was talking about Rattlesnake Master. Here is Rattlesnake Master in all its glory. It's a gorgeous plant. It is fantastic in full sun. Uh, it, it stays in bloom throughout the entire summer and into the fall. It's great in containers, as Linda was saying, because it has this very distinct architectural form. By the way, when you're working with containers with native plants, make sure you're going with a pot depth of at least 12 inches. Pardon me for speaking in inches. Uh, Monarda, as we spoke of earlier. And here, <laughs> is Retibida pinnata, or yellow coneflower. 
and it's it's actually in a different botanical family but you can see why it's considered a coneflower because of the its distinct shape here's another lovely plant common yarrow gorgeous in the garden and in uh bouquets all right let's move on forgive my back as i grab things here we have a lovely container filled with a very good selection. This is sweet joe pie weed or Eupatorium um, maculatum. Here is the one of the very last Echinacea pallida or pale purple cone flowers, a great plant for a full sun or part shade. It can handle unamended horrible clay as well as good quality soils. Here it comes in, the petals uh, tend to be a variety of colors, as you can see, it's really quite lovely. And uh, two different types of blazing star we have right here. Um, this is the uh, Liatra spicata, and here we have the meadow blazing star. It's a little bit puffier. Um, another great blazing star is the Liatra sespera, which blooms in the fall and like sandy soils. And uh, ours are not in bloom yet because that's at least a few months away. Also right here is Little Blue Stem, which is a gorgeous native grass. Only gets about two to two and a half feet tall. And uh, the, I don't know how well you can see it, but it has these beautiful blades that are turquoise and blue and green and gray. It's really quite spectacular in the garden. Uh, let's move on. Here's one of the great all stars of the summer garden. This is blanket flower or uh, Gallardia arista, arista. And uh, it likes a full sun site or sandy soil. It's not native to Ontario, but it does survive beautifully here and it's well worth it. Um, great plant. If you happen to want to deadhead it, it will keep blooming all the way into fall. It's a beautiful plant. One thing I wanted to also mention is we are talking about uh, pollinator gardens and the importance of planting uh, uh, your garden with pollinators in mind. There isn't a wildflower that isn't important and that doesn't have relationships with uh, a whole slew of pollinators because wildflowers and, and, and pollinators evolved for thousands of years together and they have symbiotic relationships. And so anytime you plant any wildflower, you're creating a pollinator garden. Here we have a beautiful close up on those nodding wild onions. Hello, you can see that I hope. And Silver King Artemisia is a beautiful, beautiful ground cover. Uh, for full center part shade. Just gorgeous. Okay, here's some treats. Now, most people are familiar with the common black eyed Susan or Rudbeckia herta. They're actually biennials, most of the Rudbeckia hertas, which means that they uh, they only live for two years. They, they make uh, roots and and foliage the first year and produce flowers the second year and seed and then die off. But because their seeding is so prolific, they seem to be pure, truly uh, perennial. But here is a kind of black-eyed Susan or Rudbeckia. This one's called the Rudbeckia subtomentosa or sweet black-eyed Susan. And it is a true perennial. And it is a super handsome, late blooming uh, wildflower. And it's about, two and a half to three and a half feet tall. It's fantastic. Uh, and then right behind it is Culver's root or uh, Ver Ver Veronicastrum. It's really quite beautiful. And here is a Verbena stricta. These are beautiful spikes. There are two types of Verbena. They're both purple spikes. Uh, one of them uh, is tall and the other one and likes a, kind of a rich soil and moisture and then the ver verbena uh, has, has started, actually I have it reversed, verbena stricta is the shorter one. 
Um, and then behind it is a very important uh, ancient prairie plant. This is big blue stem. And here it is in bloom. And you can see that you can identify it this time of year by its turkey claw. So you see it, a blossom looks just like a turkey claw. These guys get six to eight feet tall. And they are absolutely beautiful in the garden. Right here is a very important plant called mountain mint. And all of the, the, the beekeepers that we know have it in their meadows and in their gardens because it, it's super attractive for pollinators. It's a beautiful plant. That's mountain mint. can't talk about wildflowers without talking about the common Rebecca herta or uh, black-eyed Susan. Um, herta actually means fuzzy in Latin and the leaves are actually quite fuzzy and that's how when you come upon them you know that you've got Rebecca herta and this one is as I said earlier the, earlier, the biennial. Here is the classic purple cone flower, or an Echinacea purpurea. And uh, it's, it's a good midsummer, long blooming, uh, classic plant. And uh, I have a, a, a field of the purple cone flowers from Wildflower Firm on the cover of my book, Taming Wildflowers. There's some very interesting theories about why we're attracted to wildflowers or any kind of flower that has a face on it, uh, a head on it, and uh, it seems that we really respond well to this particular shape and uh, as human beings and also as insects. Okay, I'd like to get into a couple of very unusual wildflowers. Again, ancient prairie plants. These are the leaves of the compass plant. Big, you can see it's, it's half as big as I am. And the leaves really resemble oak leaves in terms of their shape. And this is a plant that is a member of the Silphium family. Um, and there are three beautiful wildflowers that are in the Silphium family. This one is the compass plant. It's called the compass plant because the leaves actually have chemicals in them that line up like a compass to point north and south for real in the garden. They just line up north and south. They have very tall stems and flowers, um, 8 to 10 to 12 to 14 feet tall. Here is uh, one of the blossoms from it. Actually, this is the cup plant, um, which is its cousin. This, this is another kind of silphium. It's called the cup plant because it has a cup-shaped leaf structure that actually holds water that is fantastic for all the birds and the other pollinators to drink from, and they do. And uh, it's a beautiful plant. Now I want to show you another silphium. This one looks very much like a tropical plant or elephant ears. And this is an ancient prairie plant that has been, uh, this species has been growing for thousands of years prior to European settlement, which is my definition of a native plant, by the way. Any plant that has been growing here in North America prior to European settlement. And you can see these leaves are huge and they have a very sort of um, sandpapery texture, which again is a, a deterrent for, to be eaten up by anybody around. And it, so it's an interesting plant. Moving on to another unusual plant. Uh, this is the woodland sunflower. And if you have an area in the shade uh, that very little will grow in, if anything. 
and you want a, a big swath of something, this is an excellent choice. It will take over the area, but you want to plant it knowing that that's the look you want um, in terms of stewardship for the area. Um, and that brings me to a very good point, which is that uh, there are a lot of, there's a lot of misinformation still out there about native plants. Some of them are extremely well behaved and uh, clump forming. Um, some of them do spread, some of them uh, self sow, but some of them do not. Um, so generalizing is, is never a good idea because it's always good to do research on the plants that you're thinking about putting into your garden. Here's more cup plants right there. Yeah. Now, I want to talk about one more plant. It's one of my super favorites. This is called wild quinine. And it's got a very, very sturdy seed head. It, it's in bloom from, in our region from, uh, late June all the way into the fall. It's extremely versatile. You can grow in a sandy soil, loam or clay, and you can grow it in full sun or part shade. Uh, in arrangements, if you like making flower arrangements like I do, uh, it can function as the primary design element in a bouquet or a garden. Uh, or it can play a, a good secondary role. So wild quinine is a great, great plant. Interestingly enough, uh, the Latin on it is Parthenium integrifolium, which uh, it, it, it really describes the plant very, very well. But wild quinine, its common name is, um, is a bit of a misnomer. It can be confusing because it, it was used uh, decades ago as a substitute for quinine. So it's not actually quinine, it is a legitimate medical substitute for quinine. And I'm, I'm not in the medical field, so that's pretty much all I know about that. Um, but it is a beautiful, beautiful uh, color. Um, so I thought it would be interesting to spend our last few minutes uh, looking at a few different plants um, and talking a little bit about seed production, uh, if I have the time. And uh, then we'll make a little bouquet uh, and that, that should do it. So I've brought with me some wildflowers that I have grown from seed. And uh, these are all things that are not in bloom currently, uh, but it, Growing from seed is not a difficult thing to do. Here's a really beautiful um, leaf structure. This is um, wild blue flax or linum. And uh, it's, it's really very lovely. And it has soft blue flowers, little tiny blue flowers. Uh, and it blooms in late spring, early summer. It's low growing, so you would either put it in the front of a border, or if you're building a meadow, then you could put it absolutely anywhere because one of the interesting things about native plants, and many plants in general, is that the early bloomers are much shorter because their job is to produce flowers and reproduce, and of course, to do so to attract pollinators. So earlier blooming flowers tend to be much lower to the ground, Whereas the later you get it into the season, the taller the plants get. So this is blue flax. So let's talk a little bit about um, how to grow wildflowers from seed. Uh, there are basically two methods or two types of wildflowers uh, in terms of, of growing from seed. There are those that will uh, not require cold moist stratification and those that do. In English, what that means is certain wildflowers need to go through um, a period of freezing and thawing and freezing and thawing uh, in order for the hard seed head to uh, break down and for this, the, the seed to get the message, oh, it's spring, time to grow. So 
Uh, then there's another group of wildflowers we call the sow and grow that do not require that process. Um, so we actually at Wildflower Farm have come up with a method to uh, accelerate the process of uh, those plants that require cold moist stratification. Um, the, 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 the relaxed natural slow method is to follow nature's cue, which is to uh, simply plant the seeds in the fall because in nature the seeds fall to the ground in the fall time and and then they're gradually covered over by uh, refuse and and leaves and all kinds of things and uh, then they go through the freeze thaw freeze thaw of the uh, the winter time and then in the spring with moisture and warmth they wake up and begin to grow but you can you can accelerate that process by doing what we call the speed dial method which is actually on the wildflower farm website so you don't feel like you have to take notes on this and um it it's simply putting the seeds in moist growing medium in the refrigerator and then the freezer over a 24-hour cycle so 24 hours in the refrigerator 24 hours in the freezer five times you go through that five times and the cycle is and and there's a little video i made on the wildflowerfarm.com website about this so you can see what that's like and then we also have information about the traditional methods um so they're both not that difficult to do um and uh, even though we're not open to the public and selling plants anymore we just sell seeds online i just can't stop growing plants so I always have plants around and gardens that I'm building and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, so I want to talk for a minute about uh, this plant. This is uh, a Baptisia or uh, white indigo or white wild indigo. In June it makes white spikes, white spikes. And this little plant will become like a shrub. It will become three feet wide, two and a half to three feet wide, and about two and a half to three and a half feet tall with purple, handsome purple stems with white spikes in June. It's an amazing plant. Many people are familiar with the blue false indigo. It's cousin or Baptisia, uh, Australis, and then there's also a yellow one um, that is native, and uh, it has gorgeous yellow spikes. It's only about two feet tall. Um, all of this that we're talking about is on the Wildflower Farm website, which is really a wildflower growing guide as well as being a seed catalog. It's quite extensive. If it were in book form, it would be over a thousand pages. So there's a lot of good information there about how to really dig into everything I'm talking about here. Um, so that is the white al Baptisia or Alba. Here's another guy that is in the Echinacea family. This is Echinacea tennesseensis, and it is not native to here. It is native to Tennessee, but tends to survive quite well here. Uh, generally about 80% of the wildflowers, uh, the seeds that we carry are native to Ontario, but we do carry a couple of, of specialty items like the Tennesseeensis, and it, um, it is lower to the ground. It's about two feet tall and stays in bloom pretty much all summer long. So starts earlier than the purple cone flower and stays in bloom longer than the purple cone flower. So an interesting plant to consider. Um, then, if you have a very dry, gravelly area or a stone fence uh, that you want, or a hillside that you want something to cascade over, uh, then this is a great plant for you. This is called, the common name for it is more memorable, wine cups wine cups and it has these beautiful uh, wine colored uh, cup shaped blossoms 
And this literally will cascade off of gravelly, very sandy, sharp drainage areas. And it will stay in bloom from uh, late spring all the way to the fall. So this, the Latin on it is um, a Calero in volucrata, which is a lovely word. So that's what this guy is. Um, yeah. So, and then here is a, a purple cone flower that I've grown from seed that I'm going to be planting tomorrow. I was waiting until after we finished up with our workshop tonight uh, so I could show it to you. And this plant I, I did by the speed dial method in April. And then I have been simply growing it in the pot. When you grow plants from seed, you want to make sure that when you plant the plants out, that they have a big, fat, solid root system. Let's do the test. There you go. Solid. Yeah, so oftentimes people are anxious to get their, their newly grown seedlings into the ground. Just wait. You can plant perennials, which is what these wildflowers are, all summer long. Uh, the latest date you want to plant them would be in, uh, in our region, I would say, mm, first or second week of September in order for the root systems to get seen. Yeah. So, that gives you uh, a few different uh, glimpses into uh, what happens here at Wildflower Farm and some of the different wildflowers that we carry um, and that, that are really quite easy to grow and that all attract pollinators. So uh, I, I haven't kept track of the time. This is one of the shortest talks I've ever done. So um, how are we doing? We're good. We have a, a bit over 15 minutes. Um, there's only Perfect. been one. There's only been one question come in, and it was about um, which garden zone Aurelia is in. For Linda, um, for well, I, I'm always hesitant to answer zone questions for a few specific reasons. I'm happy to give you. One, everybody's property is slightly different. And within your property, you may have areas that are more protected and therefore you can grow uh, plants that are really for a, a, a warmer climate. Um, plus, there's a huge difference as, as a resource when you look at zone charts because there are Canadian gardening books and there are American gardening books, and the zonage systems are different. Um, so generally, I think if I recall correctly, we're kind of around 5B or something like that. I could be wrong about that. What I do know is that all the different plants, uh, the native plants that and grasses that we have been growing for many years and that we harvest and sell the seeds for are all hardy through zone three, which is way, way north of here, like Thunder Bay and, you know, up in the Sioux, you know, uh, way north in like the Yukon area. So uh, I hope that that is enough of an answer for your question. Yeah. <laughs> and um, if you do find you have further questions, after you have a good look at wildflowerfarm.com. Our email is all over the website and we receive email questions all the time. Uh, and we're happy to, to answer questions as, as they come to you. Mm -hmm. Great. I have a question. I think that um, the question I get the most is about identifying things that are in your garden and uh -huh. where, where to start. Um, like where to go in order to identify? Well, there's a number of great field guides out there. Plus, uh, on the Wildflower Farm website, there are uh, full color pictures of all the wildflowers in bloom. And then in my book, Taming Wildflowers, one of the, the many different things about this book is that there are pictures of seedlings because 
I, I know for myself for years, whenever I was uh, needing to um, sort out a garden, weed a garden, do whatever it is in, in a garden, I could never tell because the flowers weren't in bloom yet what was uh, a wildflower and what was by the broad category of that I had at the time a weed. Um, so there are pictures of the of what the plants look like. Um, so you'll find lots of pictures, you know, like this that you can identify, for example, uh, in in there. Uh, here, for example, is a picture, uh, uh, is, a, is the uh, great blue lobelia. We saw it almost in bloom in my garden. And here is what the seedling looks like. Yeah. So again, which is really quite lovely. It looks like a primula, in fact, if you're familiar with the non-native primulas. Um, but uh, that's something that's really, really helpful, I find, is, is being able to identify what the seedlings look like. Uh, does that help, Tanya? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll, I would just comment too, um, I do use the, there's an app on your phone if you're an app phone yes. person. Um, yes. There's lots of different apps. Um, I've used the Picture This app. It's, it's free. Um, and you take a photo of the plant, especially the young ones. I'm not so good with some of the younger ones. Um, and you take a photo of the seedling and they'll, they'll give you suggestions on what it could be. So that's a great idea. Yeah. yeah. I've been, I've been gardening for so long that even though I use the apps, I forget to think about them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a very good idea. Yeah. Any other questions for us? doesn't seem like it. If you wanted to, I don't know if you had anything else about creating um, bouquets of wildflowers. Oh, sure. Absolutely. We can make a bouquet right now. Okay. So I'll just start with this because it's a great place to start. It's really helpful to, uh, to think about the plants Ha the, the flowers having faces almost. Years ago when I was learning floral design work, you wanna make sure that everybody can, see, it's like taking a photograph. You wanna see everybody's face. So here's the Joe Pye weed. I'm gonna nudge up the blazing stars and separate the goodness of these two beautiful uh, pale purple cone flowers. And then I'm gonna add in some other elements. Um, I think what I will do, I, there's different schools of thought about working with, with bouquets, but I like working in blocks. So now I've got a beautiful big fat block of black eyed Susans right here. And then the next thing I might do is just grab, if I'm making a really big bouquet, which I'm going to do here, a big block of these guys. And you want to keep looking around, circling around the bouquet so you can see it. It's really important to nudge the faces of the, the flowers upwards so everyone can, can enjoy their beauty. Yeah, okay, there we go. Now let's add in The Silver King Artemisia down towards the front. That looks lovely and inviting. And uh, that will look really pretty there. Now we want something that will give us um, some height as well. We've got the height here from the little blue stem, but let's see if we can find something else uh, to give us some height. And I'll show you a trick with that. So here we have these culver's roots. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to gently coax them in. You can see out the back here that the stem is coming out the back, but 
I bring it into the bouquet, this one right here, and it gives us height. And then I take another one and I will put it, I loosen my grip on the bouquet so we can see better what we're doing and it can kind of uh, coax it in. And then around the back, I'm gonna put this big one. So it's peeking around the corner. And I'm always looking, looking, looking to see what it looks like. I'm feeling like the Joe Pye weed is too high up. So I'm gonna put it down a little bit, but I'm looking around. How's that looking so far? Yeah? It looks beautiful. Okay. Now, here's one of my secrets. This is one of my secret weapons, the wild quinine. I like to put it in as inside the bouquet. So suddenly the bouquet has kind of more oomph. Also when you add white or yellow, things really pop. And then here I'm putting it down on the side. So if I want to balance this out, I'm going to put another strip of it on the bottom. Right. And I check there. Yeah. So there's a lot of information about making wildflower bouquets in my book, Taming Wildflowers, which you can buy at wildflowerfarm.com. And there's a huge DIY wildflower wedding section as well. Um, now what we've done here is make a very brightly colored bouquet. Um, there are also uh, lots of wildflowers that have more subtle colors and you can have a very uh, subtle bouquet. You know, whatever um, palette you want to go with, you can definitely find a wildflower uh, cut cut flower solutions. Um, so I'll show you something else that will look super cool. We're going to use these giant compass plant leaves that look like giant oak leaves along the back. There we go. So you can walk down the aisle in that or just put it uh, a bouquet uh, if you're having a uh, a socially distanced dinner party, um, or just just to make yourself happy, and uh, so I and I really appreciate uh, the excuse to uh, today that I I had to wander around and uh, pick flowers uh, so that I could show you how to do this. Now notice how I'm moving one of the the blazing stars over because now it's it's much more even yeah yeah so thanks everybody uh real pleasure spending time with you this evening and uh hope you've uh, all learned something about wildflowers mm. there's a question that just came yeah. in sure. um, from eleanor who says i have prairie meadow planted fall of 2004 at this time of year not much in bloom what can i plant to fill in the season you have a meadow a Eleanor? prairie meadow. Yes. Um, there's lots that should be in bloom. I don't know where you got this meadow and what what the seeds sources are, um, because all the meadows that we have have lots in bloom right now. So there should like right now there there should be, depending on the conditions you have lots and lots in bloom. I suggest again, you visit the Wildflower Farm website and take a look at all the different meadow mixes that we have. And then there's also on the website, a super amazingly helpful tool called the Seed Selector Tool. And you can put in what's in bloom at different times. times. And uh, that, that should also assist you. Is your book at the Birdhouse in downtown Aurelia? I feel like it's I at the Birdhouse and at Manticore Books oh, and available through, through Wildfire Farm as well. Great. Yeah. Okay. I think that David is going to 
end off our presentation, I'm going to share my screen again. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see, there's my dog. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, David. Oh, I think you're still muted, David. Just a minute. All right. How's there that? Yeah. All right. Uh, on behalf of the Kuchichin Conservancy and uh, our Passport to Nature program, I'd really like to thank both uh, uh, Miriam uh, and Linda uh, for their presentations this evening. I know I learned a lot about wildflowers um, this evening, and uh, I spend a fair amount of time in the field, and it's always great to be able to identify what you're taking pictures of. So uh, once again, thank you so much for your presentations and thank you all for attending our webinar. We hope to see you at the next one. Thanks so much, everybody. Awesome, that was fun. Yeah, it was. <laughs> Take care, have a good evening. Yeah, you too. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you, David. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. bye, -bye.